And welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Wide Awake News Radio right here on the Rents Radio Network. My name is Doug Owen, filling in tonight for Charlie McGrath, who is flying and hopefully not being too accosted by the TSA and uh, maybe a little jet lagged, said that he may come on to the show if uh, at some point that is convenient or if he's able to. So uh, we're going to kind of play that by ear. I've got a lot of things that I want to talk about tonight. So uh, thank you for lending me your ear and your time this evening. If you would like to be part of the show, if you have any comments that you would like to share or other things you would like to put on the record, you can do so in the uh, last segment or so of the show. We will take phone calls at 877-342-6673. And so... We are here. It's Monday, and I've been talking about this a lot on, on my own podcast and in uh, in with uh, most of my family and in close circles, uh, looking at where we're at financially in this country. And the fact that interest rates are rising seems to many in this country to be a great prospect because that means that is the return for those out there hit in the saving market. Uh, if you're saving money, you like interest rates. You get a return on those bonds. The 20-year treasury, uh, you can look at the math and, and do the numbers and not returning a whole lot. So uh, though the returns are almost minuscule, uh, the Federal Reserve now owns uh, an unprecedented $2 trillion worth of of U.S. debt. So at some point, the American people, if you can imagine this, if you can wrap your mind around this idea, are going to be paying that back, even though the interest payments, the usury to the IRS, to this system, far exceed what the government, even in the most ridiculous Orwellian nightmare, TPP, uh, the Asian Union on crack, the full integration of the global economy, uh, using slave labor in third world markets and uh, the, the, a corporatocracy utopia. Even in that climate of despotism and feudalism, I don't think we'd still be able to pull off paying back these debts. So uh, that reality is becoming more and more apparent by the day, something that just years ago was very taboo to talk about, and that is, the, the dying economy in this country and, uh, of course, the uh, repercussions of globalization, the new world order. So uh, there are new preparations technologically, militarily, geopolitically uh, that are being made right now as we speak. And so we're going to talk about some of those. You may note that um, every once in a while in a blue moon, pun intended, I fill in for uh, Charlie McGrath. We do a podcast called the Doomcast, and you can go and check it out at doomcast.com. We're now uh, going to be doing Doomcast number three, where we talk a little bit about some of the lighter side of impending doom. I think a lot of people appreciate it. You're either going to really like it or it's probably going to offend you. It's somewhat polarizing because uh, I, I think that so many people's hopes, dreams, and uh, our, our future not just for the people in this country, in the United States of America and other Western nations, but humanity itself really hinge on uh, the next, I would say, 100 years. Are we going into the transhumanist society? Are we going to all be plugged in and genetically modified avatars uh, living in some kind of technocratic uh, dystopia? Can that happen? Will we make it through the Industrial Revolution resource wars? are definitely the, the focal point of the 21st century thus far. We're only 13, almost 14 years into uh, this new shift, this new paradigm. But uh, tonight is a blue moon, so I think appropriately, uh, I didn't know exactly what a blue moon was. I heard about it. <laughs> I knew that it only happened occasionally. That It's a colloquialism for something that doesn't happen very often. And it's when you have a second full moon in a single solar calendar. So that's happening tonight. So if you're feeling frisky, uh, that may be why. And uh, um, anyway, also once in a blue moon, we get the story 
from the CIA. So there's two things I do want to talk about, and that is this week, or actually rather last week, but still being reported on heavily this week, is the highly publicized declassification of the CIA coup in Iran in 1953 to ouster Mohammed Mozadek. And they have all sorts of neat infographics. You know, they, they mastered the Delphi technique, the CIA, MI5, uh, through uh, many projects. ML, uh, well, excuse me, uh, MK Ultra, part of that. Uh, so, uh, it, it very, very, Rand Corporation also uh, worked on perfecting this technique, uh, creating consensus. But uh, so it's it, it's pretty eerie <laughs> to see how. Well, number one, that uh, what we're we're looking at in this document, I think, is playing out to a T. I mean, it completely parallels what we're seeing happening in Egypt, and we're going to get there. Don't worry. But uh, full admission that, yes, they orchestrated this very elaborate hoax on the world. They perpetrated this on behalf of corporate partners, British Petroleum, and others in the region. They, of course, stood to uh, benefit from it. Uh, The Rockefellers and Rothschilds and uh, all of the global banking syndicate and uh, let's let's not forget that this is being used as the wedge to control Eurasia. So uh, the, a lot of that's playing out. And most of you that have been watching Russia today probably uh, have seen some of the splintering on uh, policy, geopolitical policy, foreign policy between the United States and Russia, especially with some of the revelations over this. Uh, I think not such a huge story that. Uh, that uh, you know, the United States has been spying on the American people and people and governments abroad should not be a shocker to most of Charlie's listenership. And so uh, with that being said, uh, the CIA coup in 1953 is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's so on the record. It's in this, such a non-story in my mind because you had Kermit Roosevelt and many of the other ar- architects and uh, people directly uh, involved in the coup d'etat itself that have written books. So uh, it's not really uh, that big of a deal. But uh, if that's not enough for you, if the CIA declassifying uh, this project, the coup, one of many, now foreign policy, a.k.a. the Council on Foreign Relations, saying that this is the 14th nation that officially the United States has uh, overthrown via coup d'etat. And, uh, well, you can wait for the CIA to count the other 20 or so that have happened uh, in the last decade, uh, not to mention uh, throughout the the 80s, especially in South America, uh, namely. But uh, that might not be enough for you. So they have the declassification of Area 51. The CIA has now admitted its existence not quite the full disclosure that some of you maybe were hoping for. We now found out that drones, yes, drones, which we see everywhere, they're almost ubiquitous in society today. Uh, they were first developed there in the early and uh, all the way up to early 60s, all the way up to uh, present day. Uh, who, who, the technology at Skunk Works and the, the creations there. Uh, of course, uh, have tons of speculation and uh, insider whistleblowing and and other uh, you know great and sometimes romantic stories that surround uh, this. So I know it's something that a lot of people have been pushing forward with and wanting. And I would almost say that I can't think of any of the enthusiasts that want full disclosure. And when I say that, I'm talking about you know alien encounters. Uh, contact with extraterrestrials, uh, uh, other alien life form uh, communications, things like that, that kind of exposure. So I don't think that this is going to put any of those people's uh, minds to rest. And I I think this is far from what uh, they were hoping to see. We'll talk more about it. There is plenty to get into. Still much more ahead. This is Wide Awake News Radio. Stay tuned. And welcome back. This is Wide Awake News. Doug Owen filling in for Charlie McGrath. 
Taking your phone calls, 877-342-6673. You can also chat and interact at Charlie's website. That's wideawakenews.com. Links to listen and all that uh, that you need to be part of the show is there. So we talked about the CIA coup, 1953. Uh, George Washington University, the CIA, has put out all of the documents. If you haven't gone through them, it's worth going through because if you are like myself, uh, subscribing or at least entertaining some of these videos that we've been seeing out of Egypt, you have to wonder how much of this is scripted for the Western media, how much of this is actually genuine. And I do believe that there are genuine things that are happening on the ground that are uh, 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 heinous atrocities and death and murder and uh, all of the things that go along with with chaos and massive amounts of concentrated anger that are, of course, misplaced. Uh, they, they are towards the state, the military dictatorship. Uh, the, the, the fact that um, I think the Egyptian people themselves are now understanding that what they have is not democracy. It, it, is, it is absolutely nothing less than what they had under uh, Mubarak and uh, that uh, their own government is not representing those people themselves. I mean, it's, it's very simple. You have, you have uh, the, the Turkish government, the, you have the Saudi Arabian government, of course you have Israel, Jordan, and, and the rest that are playing uh, the Middle East politics, and, and you see those lines being uh, quickly and easily uh, identified between the Western friendlies and uh, those that are not. So all of this is descending into... Uh, quite a, a political uh, quagmire, but at the same time, the people themselves are not going to buy into this illegitimate system. Uh, but what we're seeing is, uh, you know, the, the the failure of legitimacy, and, and that's what happened. They didn't have the consensus, and they didn't have the legitimacy to stabilize the government. You're seeing the same thing in Libya. You can have a bunch of fake elections and make it look okay, and find some. Western educated puppet to uh, an academic, a technocrat, uh, maybe from Brussels, to put in charge of this interim government. But uh, it's not working in the Muslim world. And because of all of the uh, atrocities that have been attached to our peace building missions in the region, uh, getting the people, the civilians to to buy in is absolutely uh, impossible. We're seeing that in Iraq, uh, you know, years later, six trillion dollars later, some estimates as high as nine trillion dollars later. So um, <clears throat> we we uh, have taken a lot away from that. And so of those those people in those respective countries. So uh, I think a lot of people are questioning who's behind this who ultimately is pulling the strings. And uh, I, I think that, uh, of course, the Muslim Brotherhood has been traditionally supported by the United States and uh, because of the strategic alliance and treaties that Egypt has held with Israel uh, and, and the fact that they are such a partner, uh, they are willing to work with whoever is in control. And so... Uh, it, it, it's it's pretty sad because uh, the, the people themselves, they're actually being slaughtered with U.S. weapons and, uh, let's be honest about it, uh, U.S. dollars. So anyway, um, it's, it's a sad situation. And uh, the, the analysis that you can give to it or take away from it is that when you have people that have no options and they see no legitimacy in the system they they no longer believe in it and you do have mutiny you have uh sedition and you potentially have a civil war you have the fractional breakdown of a country and you have non-sectarian violence and and, and for those out there that believe that this is part of a u.s israeli plot uh, there's plenty of documentation to back up those assertions when you look at Project P2OG and, and uh, many of the other 
uh, paths to Persia, Zygmunt Brzezinski's uh, work on uh, the region and uh, Middle Eastern affairs. Uh, so there are some some binding documents there. But all of this is taken away, I think, ultimately from where we're going with the economy. And Europe is on hold. We are seeing uh, this this huge inflation, uh, the bubbles being blown up in the European and U.S. economies. The Federal Reserve is almost uh, out of options, and the need to create inflation is uh, huge. They, they have to get people spending money, putting it back into the economy, and doing that to create growth. At least that's the model. That's the Keynesian model. Let's keep growing, keep building and uh, don't worry about the debt that's accrued. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. I think in a paraphrase, uh, a quote that's often at least attributed to him, and that is that it's your duty and right to spend your grandchildren's money. So that's one thought uh, uh, behind all of this, is that we can spend our way out of the atrocities that are happening in the markets. And that is what they are calling bond apocalypse. Now, if you haven't heard about bond apocalypse, it's pretty simple. And that is that uh, U.S. debt and these interest rates at some point will have to go up. And banks, many of which are insolvent, would not be able to make these interest payments. And thus, uh, the insolvency that we already believe that they have will be shown. And so we're, we're looking at a bail-in or a uh, banking holiday as a solution to that. We'll talk more about it. You can be part of it. 877-342-6673. It's Wide Awake News. Bail in, bail out. Really just depends on which side of the wall you're on when it comes to how the banks will reappropriate your money through taxation, through inflation, through direct confiscation in many cases. And it's it's happening already in the United States. In California, just a few years back, they were taking uh, dead people's uh, safety deposit boxes and cracking those open. And uh, there was one case where there were some very important and precious jewels, some pearls, uh, family heirlooms that were uh, valued at over $100,000. I mean, really rare antique jewelry. Uh, and they sold it off for pennies, absolute pennies, uh, comparatively to what it was. And, and, and the story, at least made national headlines and the people in this one instance were able to reclaim their property and get their their gems back but uh that is to also point at the hundreds if not thousands that lost their property or their property was confiscated with or without their knowledge of loved ones that should have been rightfully part of their estate uh so uh the, the, the banks are already stealing stuff. <laughs> I, I recently had to do some banking and uh, one of the, the perks of one of their, you know, upward mobility plans where you pay them to hold your money, which just seems kind of laughable in and of itself. Uh, it should be the other way around, considering that I have to work for money. They can just create it with their uh, dumb monochrome terminals. Uh, but they were offering a safety deposit box. And you know, immediately, the first thing I thought was, that's the least safe place in the world. The IRS uh, decides one day that you owe them money. They're going to go right there first. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they go right to your bank? They already work for the same people. Uh, so uh, I, I, I don't have a lot of faith in banks, and neither do people. So uh, let's just talk about Bitcoin real quickly. Mt. Gox, if you're not familiar, is one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, Bitcoin uh, mediator. Uh, I'm not a Bitcoin expert, but Mt. Gox is one of the big exchanges where you can buy and uh, sell, apparently, allegedly, in my opinion, uh, Bitcoins to, to for, for cash money. Uh, Bitcoin if you're in the dark or under a rock and you just come to the internet is uh, a non-state uh, non-sanctioned currency that is peer to peer. That means that you can send money directly to a person and uh, there are no associated P 
people or mediators in that process. You don't necessarily have to give your money to PayPal. Then PayPal gives it to your financial institution or gives you a credit card or a PIN card if you're in Europe or, or whatever it may be. This is just direct transfer of a non-state private currency. Sounds great. Uh, there's pros and cons, and uh, we're not going to get into the you know, ins and outs of why you should or should not put your money in Bitcoin. But when the banking system is failing, people run to Bitcoin, and we saw that in Cyprus. Now, there was a huge demonization of Bitcoin. There was a concerted, orchestrated media attack against Bitcoin because of, well, the, the obvious ability to skirt regulation and other currency restrictions. Now, whether you're getting drachmas, rubles, U.S. dollars, the reserve notes, loonies, whatever it may be, when you go to your bank, if you're getting those, those certain currencies, there may be restrictions. In Cyprus, we saw the uh, different restrictions that they're putting on, on the ability to take money out of the country. Can't take so much money with you. So if you want to leave with your money, when they're in a crisis state, and we, we all know that government is usually ruled by crises. The big changes that we see societally are from a crisis and the response there too. Uh, so in, in a banking crisis, those kind of restrictions, the state may apply to you. Now, if you have Bitcoin, <laughs> that's not a problem because that's attached to your Bitcoin wallet not to some restriction. So you don't have to, you know, it, they, they, they have no control over how many Bitcoins you're allowed to take from your electronic wallet. And you can leave virtually with nothing in your hands. It's one of the problems that you have with gold. Uh, and not that, you know, gold's not great to own. And if you have some, you're probably happy about that. Uh, but if you have a lot of it, 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 you you have a problem maybe if you want to transport it. Yeah, you know, it, it, I'm talking about if you have bars upon bars, uh, it, you have to find some way to, to move it. So that's one of the downsides to to gold. You can bury it anywhere and leave it for uh, any amount of time. One of the nice things is when you dig it back up, uh, it'll usually almost always stand the test of time. So if you buried it back in 1910, you'd be doing a lot better off than if you had buried some dollars. So uh, there are some, you know, really uh, physical and uh, great reasons to have gold as well. And uh, some, some really handy reasons to have Bitcoins at this moment in history because of the uncertainty that we see in global and financial markets. Sorry, I'm drinking a bunch of filtered water here. It's been a really hot day. We're in central Texas and it's, actually it's not that bad, but... Uh, I, I get parched here. Anyway, so back, back to Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a great way to kind of skirt all of these currency rules and regulations and other laws and other restrictions primarily, especially when you're having a bail-in. <laughs> if you can't get your money out of the bank, it's a big problem. Now, the German government has gone ahead and uh, they are looking to the future and they have already now said that this is uh, a currency. Now, a lot of people are cheering for that because now it's an actual currency. Well, what does that mean? Well, taxes may apply. See, when you transfer money, the state usually gets a piece. Unless you're really smart and uh, you, or, or, or you're able to, to do it without their knowledge in the gray or black market. But if you're doing it, quote unquote, above bar, uh, usually the government has their dirty little fingers in, in your pocket. Now, they'd love to get their, their hands in your Bitcoin wallet. They just haven't wrapped their minds around the legislative chair uh, is somewhat dated. <laughs> if you look at these people like John McCain, they're not, uh, they're not up on how to get Bitcoins out of your pocket. So uh, there are plenty of corporate sponsored backers and bankers that are working behind the scenes and of course the purveyors and uh, the, the the ones that are out in front of this of course are germany so rightfully wrongfully um and and, and i think that we're going to see a huge amount of uh interest and we're going to see a huge spike in bitcoin i'm not telling you to invest i'm not a bitcoin 
money manager. I actually do not myself personally own a Bitcoin wallet. I had one at one time and I, I've not been able to retrieve the Bitcoin wallet that had a few Bitcoins in it. So it'd be worth a few hundred dollars if I did. Uh, but I think for the most part, it is attached to a computer that I don't have any longer. Say la B, my short sightedness and lack of understanding at the time uh, made me a victim. So I guess there's a takeaway there. We've learned something from that $500 mistake. But um, India, if you haven't heard, is on the verge of an economic collapse. Their solution, of course, is to create a police state, a biometric hellhole, create a total ubiquitous uh, surveillance society. Because when the economy fails, now people, uh, people get upset. People uh, create an atmosphere of crime. When people are desperate, they do desperate things. It's really that simple. But India now has a new problem, just like most governments and banks. And that is Bitcoin. Now, you might not be able to, stay, uh, to, to, to skirt or to invest in U.S. dollars. Why? Because many of these countries, and I'm not sure about India, but uh, Syria, Iran, and others make it illegal for you to own dollars. I can understand. <laughs> I can understand. It, you know, it's, uh, those aren't free societies. You can still own, I guess, uh, Iranian currency if you want, but uh, I'm sure that will uh, get you on plenty more lists than even uh, being in uh, the, the, the Verizon Family Five with Edward Snowden. And nonetheless, uh, the economic woes and the potential for currency collapse in India is very, very high. Most people say, well, what does that mean? Uh, you know, they're more worried about the Egyptian economy because if the Egyptian economy is in dire straits, then uh, gas prices go up. But this is going to, uh, I think, spur an exodus from the rupee. And you're going to see many people looking for safety in Bitcoin. All right. The final segment's coming up. Still time for you if you'd like to chime in. 877-342-6673. It's Wide Awake News. Yeah, got to get those regulations in order to be able to control the influx of people trying to buy Bitcoins or go to other alternative currencies. I'm still on the Bill Still bandwagon. And if you're familiar with Bill Still, he actually has a, a great financial documentary video. It's one of the first I saw. Uh, when when st when YouTube first came online, I watched Money Masters and then I I bought it. And uh, the only movie that I think can even rival it would be his latest uh, Creature from Jekyll Island or Lee Rogers' Power of the Purse, which is a three almost, actually almost four hour in depth expose of the economic system and how it works from tally sticks to present day. Uh, so uh, and Money Masters as well. And Bill Still's uh, idea is pretty simple. Right now, we have a government that borrows money from banks, private banks, the Federal Reserve, J.P. Morgan, the Chinese government, <laughs> the uh, you know, anybody that's willing to buy the debt. The the Federal Reserve is buying debt. They now have two trillion dollars worth of private debt, and uh, they're hoping that you're going to pay them back. Whether that happens or not uh, is anybody's guess. Uh, they would like to be able to get that money back, and that is one of the perks of the the state. Uh, they can force taxation upon the people, and thus they can borrow money. Sounds like a great scheme, right? They get they borrow money, and then they they use feudalism to force you to pay taxes into their system for stuff that you don't want. It's a grand system. Well, Bill still said it best. It's very simple. You don't have to be a mathematician, an economist, a genius, or even a really bright person to understand exactly the way it should be. And that is that the government loans money to the banks. The government makes money off of interest from the banks, and then the government is in control of the banks. See, we're not at the behest of the banks because... When the government is used as, well, let's, let's just put it in layman's terms. 
it's a degenerate gambler that just keeps borrowing more and more money and giving it to all of its corrupt, horrible friends that just take it, steal it, do things that are unproductive, and, and they lie and cheat and rip people off to the point where they feel absolutely, hopelessly lost and no longer want this representative government system that we have today. Can't, can't, can't have all these crazy people making decisions in their own self-interest at the disinterest of the global good. So when I look at the failure of government, I also note that this is empowering the idea that you want a technocracy. You want a power elite of smart people, smarter than the people that eat at McDonald's, smarter than the people that you see on TV, smarter than the John McCain's and the Lindsey Graham's and the Dems, the Nancy Pelosi's, all of these people that we all can agree are demons <laughs> of, uh, of, of who is their boss that is, uh, uh, that is always in question. But uh, I was just talking with uh, Gary during the break, and you know, one of the things about this country, and I think the world in general, is that uh, it doesn't matter who you are, really what race or creed you have, uh, you have uh, you know, been, been born into, it's really about how much money you have as to what you can get away with and what power you wield and, and how you use that to your advantage. Uh, social skills will get you much farther in this world than uh, maybe even uh, brilliance, unfortunately. Unfortunately. So, um, so the, the idea is that the government has a top-down, hierarchical approach, and then there are uh, plenty of other competitors out there like Bitcoin that can be privately regulated. You know, you take your risks. We don't want the SEC or the other regulatory authorities seizing money from people like Mt. Gox. I mean, this is the last ditch attempt, and it does also highlight the, dis the desperation of the state and the disparages of their situation, having to go after Mt. Gox, having to go after... Uh, all of these people that are daring to get outside of the dollar. Because let's be honest, perception management is key. And as long as people think that cash is king, well, cash is king. Until that perception changes, and it is changing rapidly. I had a friend that just came back from Louisiana. He was down there with his wife. Uh, she, she's a, uh, in the medical profession at some conference. And uh, you can you can go down to Nolens and use bitcoins right there uh, in the uh, uh, on Bourbon Street and uh, uh, throughout the area. So um, it, it's becoming more widely accepted, and it doesn't have the negative connotations that some of us have with using U.S. dollars, and that is the blood that's attached to it. Now the state always is going to probably have a little bit of a competitive edge in that. Uh, because the government creates money. But um, some would say, well, why would you want the elected representatives creating money instead of these really, really smart private people that seem to, to never be wrong, though we're, we're, we're just hemorrhaging jobs left and right. Those people are idiots. We're the, we're the smart people. Um, the, I mean, there's some people that are convinced that Ben Bernanke is a hero. They really are. Well, uh, that that perception is fading, I think, fast, and the proof is always in the pudding. And where we're at today, uh, Detroit is a fine example of that. And, and the response. Let's talk about Detroit just for a moment, because it's a problem, reaction, solution. You're seeing the Hegelian dialectic play out. You have a problem. The state's bankrupt. They're going to have to stop paying pensions. They're going to have to uh, throw off and absolve themselves of all of this debt. And they're either going to screw the investors or the investors are going to be uh, compensated by some other entity, whether it's you, the taxpayer, or uh, stripping the, this city and uh, the, the treasures, the arts that uh, are, are belong, belonging to it. And then we just see a corporatist, uh, raw, naked capitalist takeover and... If that might be better because it would shed uh, many of those debts and allow for regrowth, allow for the citizenry 
to to be able to rebuild something that will uh, uh, be able to flourish without all of those prior restrictions and the debt attributed to all of these misdeeds. I mean, you know, out of the ashes, there is the ability for a city like to Detroit to rebuild. But in that, somebody has to pay the price. Who's going to pay for that? Now, you as a person, you can bankrupt yourself pretty easy. George Bush made it a little harder. As a corporation, it's even easier to absolve yourself. But it's always been a staple of uh, the bond market and of the, the government debt that they constitutionally cannot default on these debts. And that's why they are uh, con- considered the, the platinum of security. You, you can't go wrong. You might not get paid much. The return might be so dismal that you're, you're just, you know, uh, the, the proverbial peeing up a rope when you're investing in the 20-year treasury. But you never thought that it was going to, it was not going to pay out. You never thought that you were going to take less away than what you put in. And so who bears the brunt? Do we, and I'm almost at the point with the scenario where I'm, I'm, I'm beyond uh, capable of comprehending paying this debt off. So uh, the, the, the austerity that we see playing out in Europe doesn't seem to be a very productive model. You know, and that's where uh, the the line between, I guess, the Webster Tarpleys, the Rand Pauls, the left, the right, the ones that want to hold responsible the people for the bad decisions they made with elected uh, officials. I understand that. And uh, really, I don't feel like I should have to pay for those misdeeds either. But we are paying so much more in corporate welfare. Uh, People have... uh, very little patience with the, their elected officials. And now the government, they're planning for you to be upset. And so is Apple. Apple has a patent now that they have put together that will allow the government to shut off phones regionally and create a complete cell phone blackout. Now, if that's not telling, they believe that this is going to be A big seller. And if it's not for you here in the United States of America, because it never is, they would never bring those drones back from Area 51 that they developed, wink, wink, at Area 51 that they brought back from the Middle East to domestically surveil the American people. That would never happen. None None of our indiscretions come home to roost in this country. Well, anyway, uh, they, they know that there's going to be that want. And so those are the devices. I mean, that's beyond prism. You know, prism just proved to me what I already believed. And that's that, you know, Skype and, and my Apple chat and just about anything else that I am transmitting over the, uh, over the net through the cloud in any form or fashion is subject to being monitored. I just like that. Now people are, getting a little bit uh, more acquainted to this idea. So it's funny because um, though I don't know if we're losing any rights that we had previously because they've been doing this since this, you know, the inception of the telephone, since the monopoly of Maud Bell, uh, they've been doing this uh, back to Project Echelon, the promise system that came out of Israel. I mean, you could just go on and on and on through the history of clandestine and, and signals intelligence in this country and around the world. And, of course, always using crises and fear to justify the unconstitutional anti-Fourth Amendment and flat treasonous illegal activities of the NSA. And uh, there's going to be people that are going to do that because they think it makes them a whole lot safer. All right, guys and gals, thank you so much for tuning into the show. Uh, Your host, Charlie McGrath, will be back next Wednesday as per usual. And if you want to check out any of the interviews, the Doomcast, all the stuff that I'm doing with Charlie and my news picks, go to blacklistednews.com. Until next time, take care.